So on today's podcast, I had the opportunity to visit with Tom Deans. Oh my gosh, what a wealth of knowledge he is. He is the author of Willing Wisdom and Every Family's Business. And he's probably the foremost thought leader on family businesses and the dynamics associated with it. You know, having a podcast, it's one of those things where, you know, you get the opportunity to visit with people that uh, are, are way over your pay grade. And he was one of those guys for me. And I've been following his work for a long time. And he has so many really, really good value nuggets in, in this episode. So I hope you enjoy my conversation with Dr. Tom Deans. Please welcome, please welcome. Welcome. This is another episode of the Defenders of Business Value Podcast, a podcast where we talk about what makes a business valuable. Learn the tips and tactics to increase your company's value that only veteran deal makers know. And now here's your host, Ed Misogland. I'm your host, Ed Misogland. I teach business owners how to build value and identify and remove risks in their business so that one day they can sell their business when they want to whom they want and how they want. On today's show, uh, this is a highlight for me. I'm uh, excited to welcome Dr. Tom Deans. He's the author of two of the best books on family business and the dynamics that accompany it. Willing Wisdom and Every Family's Business are both New York Times bestsellers and should be required reading for any family member that is thinking about being in a family business. Previously, Dr. Deans was CEO of a large multinational family business, has worked in banking, and has been the president of a railway. Tom has been featured in numerous magazines and journals, including Profit, Money Sense, Inc., The Wall Street Journal, and The New York Times. He's also a frequent guest on CNBC, Moneyline, and BNN. Tom is a highly sought-after international public speaker on succession planning, wealth management, and philanthropic giving. With his family selling businesses for more than $100 million, please, and truly, this, is a, this is, should be a highlight for you if you're in the family business. Please prepare to unlearn everything you thought you knew about business, succession planning, and wealth transfer. So welcome to the show, Tom. Ed, great to join you. Well, my overview certainly did not do you justice. Can you tell the audience how you got into this? Because every time I've seen you, it's such an interesting story about how you became one of the foremost thought leaders of family business. Well, Ed, the journey was quite frankly odd. I, uh, I was born into a family business as was my father, my grandfather and great grandfather. And, uh, and at 37, I joined our family business as, uh, as president CEO and ran that business for eight years as, as CEO and then sold it. And as I was driving out of our building down the road, looking in my rear view mirror for the one last time, I realized that we, we had never successfully transitioned a business into the next generation. We always sell them. And I thought, you know what? I think I'm going to write that book. It's going to be a weird book because every single book on family businesses that I read said, oh no, you measure the success of a family business in, in generations. You know, a fifth generation family business, well, clearly more successful than a fourth and a fourth. Well, clearly more successful than the third and the second. And so here I was, we'd never transitioned fully successfully to the next generation. And all the literature was saying that we were a failed family business. And I'm thinking, we have just sold our business for a 10 multiple EBITDA, all cash, no earn out. And I'm not feeling like a loser. In fact, this is feeling like pretty much the best day of my life. <laughs> so what the hell is going on? Like, why are these books peddling this other message? And and it has occurred to me that business owners are turning to their most trusted advisors on this subject, on the subject of transition, succession planning, exit planning, we'll call it what you want. They're turning to their most trusted advisor, which is the accountants and, and attorneys, and they're getting super biased perspective. What happens, Ed, what happens when a family business is sold and you're the accountant or you're the attorney? What happens to, yeah. your, to the file? You lose, you lose you're it. You're cooked. Yep. So there's the built-in bias. You're, you've got two really powerful and influential professions, by and large, saying to business owners, well, listen, why are you doing the state freeze? Why would you sell this business? It's a beautiful business. You're never going to get these return on your invested capital in your, in your you know, uh, private investments and in your stocks. And so what you need to do is you need to give this business to your children. And I'm thinking, I, I, I got to blow up this myth. I just got to blow it up because as, and as soon as I looked at the data, it was pretty clear. Only 30% of family businesses survive to the second generation. 
And only 10% of that, 30%, make it to the third generation. So for the founders who are listening to this podcast, they've got a 3% chance of their grandchildren owning and operating their business. Well, and like, I, I had seen... You, um, go it's ahead. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, I, no, it's just crazy. Yeah, I had seen that there was a recent study that 82% of children don't want the family business. So that, that led me to my question of, you know, so why do you think there's this forced interfamily transition? And do you think that's the reason for the low survivability rates? Well, let me just go back to that 82%. I would say that the other 18% are liars. <laughs> <laughs> I really, I don't know anyone. I mean, I don't, I, I shouldn't say that. I know very, very, very few family members, next gens, who want to pay full market value for their parents' business. That 18%, <laughs> they're hanging around because they're waiting for someone to die. They're waiting for, to get a <laughs> free business. So we create these economic incentives in our estate plans, either through trusts or in our wills, that basically said, if you hang around long enough, uh, and this is where our family money is. Like that's what entrepreneurs do, right? They hoard their personal net worth inside their business with no plan. So the kids are left thinking, well, if that's where the family money is, and if I leave, I'm probably not going to get this piece. So you know what? I love this business. <laughs> right. We create economic incentives and we, uh, we lure people in and we, we retain family members and businesses that truly don't want to be there. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, I ran into, um, uh a woman that I had done some work for and she, or for her father first, and I had done some, some value work and, and we were talking about valuation and he was naturally, he was disappointed in the value of his company. And I run into his daughter probably, I don't know, three, four years later. And she goes, you did some work for my dad. Would you redo the valuation that you did? And so I'm looking at it, at her balance sheet and oh my gosh, her father sold her company or sold his company to her for four times what I told him it was worth. So all of the earnings that company had was getting eaten up in debt service and rent to him. I mean, I'll bet you she was working for at least 85% of all of the earnings were going back to dad. And she had a 10 year note and she was four years into it. And what she ended up doing was going back to her dad and said, look, I've paid you fair market value. And he said, you know what, if you don't pay me, I'm going to sue you. And he, she said, you know, here's the keys. And she put it down and she opened another business just down the road, you know, just took everybody. And I saw, I ran into her, I don't know, probably three months ago. And I said, you know, did you ever reconcile with your dad? And she goes, I haven't spoke to him since I put the keys on his table. So th uh, there's another, and that, that leads me yeah. to my question was how many business owners are using their kids as their retirement and amplifying the value in order to maintain the lifestyle? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the oldest page in the playbook. Yeah. It's if, as if assuming, I mean, there are a whole bunch of family members who are buying and overpaying. And then at the other end, there are, there's just a huge number of businesses being gifted, but here's what happens in that gifting scenario. Mom and dad retire from the family business and draw a salary while they, while the kids are running the business. And, and eventually, you know, this gets old, yeah. right? Because we're not dying at 72. We're not dying at 82. We're dying at 92. You've got children in their 60s waiting for their parents to die <laughs> in order to really run the right. business that the, way, the way they want to. Because no one knows how to start the conversation around the, the, tr the logical, calm, rational, transparent Calm. Did I say calm? Yeah. I, I, I really need to underline that one. Right. Transition of the equity. People leave it alone. And so there's a lot of explo exploitation. There's a lot of kids who actually, I've watched this one. I've watched parents literally give their business to their kids, like the equity. Right. And then a couple of years later, watch the children sell out at full market value. You want to watch a train wreck. You want to watch a family disintegrate. I mean, these are crazy scenarios. Exploitation going both ways. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, one of the transactions that I was a, a part of that we saw the son bought the father out and, you know, let's just say that he was making $250,000 and the son came in, just came in with more technical knowledge, the ability to run spreadsheets, the ability to, to do Monte Carlo simulations and all kinds of things like that. And he just added, you know, basically a new engine to the car and 
oh my gosh, that business took off. And his dad was really upset about it. And, you know, basically, how do I get a piece of that? That was part of the potential I, I told you about, Junior. And Junior stayed, you know, he said, you know, that's a, that's me. And unfortunately, I had to get back involved and have the conversation. Of, he took the risk. That's his benefit, not yours. Yeah. And boy, and we see that a lot, that Gen 2, so to speak, yep. adds an awful lot to the business that Gen 1 didn't have. So, so how do you Absolutely. have that? How do you have that conversation where, you know, you were talking about calm and transparent. How do you even, if I'm the, if I'm gen one, how do I have that conversation with gen two? And I know part of it has to do, and I've heard you say it many times about gen two needs to invest in gen one. And that's how the transition should begin. That it's an investment like any other. Right. Is that, can you? Right. So it's, it's, it's super counterintuitive, right? I'm really what I'm imploring in my book is for the next generation to risk their capital and buy their parents' business at full market value. Like no haircuts, no, no shortcuts, no discounts for, for the family. That point is crucial. When we start discounting the value of the family business, we start creating economic incentives to keep people in businesses for all the wrong reasons. So, and, and let me share my, my story. What these questions, I have 12 questions in my book that, that really are designed to start conversations inside families to find out whether or not a, a parent has a buyer in the house. Do they have a, a son or daughter who wants to risk their capital to buy the family business at full market value? Yes or no. That's all the book does. Full stop. Right. So it doesn't, in fact, it's very short on answers, but it's got 12 wicked questions. Yep. Okay. Now, at the end of the day, this is all, this is, these are not just kind of made up questions. My father asked me these questions. I was buying shares in my father's plastics manufacturing business 12, uh, seven years before I joined as an employee. And every 12 months we'd sit down and we'd have a, an update in our, in the boardroom. We'd have a succession planning update. He'd ask me these questions. And every year he asked me if I wanted to risk my capital with the view of acquiring control. And year after year, I said, yes. And I went to the bank, I borrowed money, and I bought shares. Then he would issue a dividend. I'd take the dividend stream, I'd leverage that at the bank along with more personal savings, and I'd buy more shares and more shares. After five years of buying shares at full market value, he put me on the board of directors. Two years later, he hired me as CEO. So think of it. And yep. I was a shareholder first, I was a director second, I was an employee third. Now, when I enter into that family business as CEO, do you think I'm thinking this is the Tom Dean's legacy project? All I got to do is kind of mail it in for, I don't know, 20 years until our kids are old enough and I can hand over the business the same way and, you know, define ourselves as a plastics manufacturing family. Even the unborn will be making plastics five generations from now. Like not in our family, yeah. not in our family. That is my business to continue to risk my capital because I see a great opportunity for a return or not. And quite frankly, in 2002, for a whole bunch of reasons, like we just had a limited amount of time, um, I changed my mind. I pivoted and said, when my father asked me the question, do I want to buy more shares? I said, no. And he said, no problem. In fact, he high-fived me at the boardroom table and he said, I wouldn't buy this business either. That's a great answer. So let's get on with the business of selling it. There was no kind of, oh my God, we've, sure. we've failed. We've, we've lost our legacy. Oh, who are we now? It was just, that's not the way we're wired. Going right back to my great grandfather in the hotel business, my grandfather in chemical manufacturing, plastics manufacturing. I'm now a publisher. I've asked my two kids, 26 and 24, if they want to buy my business. They've politely, respectfully <laughs> said, guess what? No. Yeah. They're doing things that they love and they have access to family money to start the business that they're passionate about. So think of it, hotels, chemicals, plastics, publishing. Are we a failed family? No. no. I, don't, I don't think so. I think we're raising independent-minded, entrepreneurial, risk, risk-taking children, which is awesome. It's a, different, it's a different definition of what a family business is. It's not a building with our name on it. A family business is a set of values. We are in business as a family to create capital and to transition it wisely. I guess, does it matter how big the business is? Does your framework work regardless of how many commas you have in the value? The quick answer is no. In fact, what I would say is the older the firm and the bigger it is, the harder it falls and the yeah. faster it falls. So when I see, I see big old family businesses, man, 
do I get nervous? Do you know of the 100 largest firms in America in the year 1900? Do you know that only 16 of them were still in business in the year 2000? Sure, I can believe that. that's That's a ridiculous amount of wealth destruction in the modern economy. That's not a random list of 100 firms. That is the largest 100 firms. 100 years later, only 16 are in business. People do not understand, although maybe if they're watching the news, they're starting to understand how temporary and fragile businesses are. There is a, businesses just don't last. And I think if there's one audacious idea in this book is that the really smart dynastic families understand when to start businesses and they sure as hell know when to get out. And they never let the, their emotions drive those big decisions. They don't define themselves by their businesses. They understand that they have a fundamental passion for business, a love of business, but they never fall in love with our business. Yeah. Do you, do you see the subtlety in that comment? One letter, one word separates a, a big idea from a dangerous idea. And one of the, the challenges that I see is that business owners so desperately want the kids to take the business over. And when I bring up the selfishness of that want, I mean, there's a, a look of how can you possibly say that? And I'm, I'm looking at like you were talking about your kids. I mean, you didn't give them the option. You want your kids to take your business over, but at the same time, it's a reflection of the risk that you took and the sacrifices that you took. Not necessarily, you just want that to keep going. Uh, I mean, how does a business owner reconcile that? You know what? Maybe junior's not such a good idea for the business. Well, first of all, you're right. It is incredibly selfish because really behind that idea is that, again, that the most popular page in the playbook for succession planning for a business owner, right? It's hard to sell a business, but you can dodge that bullet if you get your kids into the business and then retire, pull a salary to the day you die. That's your retirement plan, yeah, I'm right? A, totally. So they get, they, get to avoid, they get to avoid having to clean up their balance sheet to reconcile their inventory to, you know, all the shenanigans yep. that go on with business owners. And so they get to dodge all that and they just leave it. They just leave their mess for someone else to clean up. And it's getting old. And quite frankly, a lot of, because business owners are living a long time, kids, when they move into their fifties, like before they would get the business, their parents would die in their seventies. They're in their thirties and forties. They got, they got time to actually run the business that they way the way they want to. Now we got business owners in their nineties. You've got business owners, second gens in their sixties. And I tell you, they're just packing up and quitting out of total frustration because they can't get the founder to talk about the transition of the shares. They just give up. They go. They leave. If I'm a kid, how do I get mom and dad to start talking about what is it that you want to do with the business? I know from a pre-sale planning standpoint, most business owners I talk to dodge the idea that this business may not be mine in the future. So if I'm the kid and I see how tight mom and dad have their hands wrapped around the business, how do I start having the conversation of, you know, you need to look at it, this as an investment rather than your identity. So how do I start that conversation? Well, I'm going to tell you, my answer is going to strike you as incredibly bizarre, but here it goes. <laughs> 125 million American adults do not have a will. If they don't have a will, they don't have a business succession plan. Half of all business owners in America don't have a will. If they don't have a will, they don't have an exit plan. And so a great place to start is, and if you're a next gen working in your parents' business that you don't own, and you've got siblings outside the business, even siblings in the business, and you don't know if your parents have a will, you're going to be in a world of hurt. You got a 50% chance that you're looking at a train wreck because what happens when mom and dad die in test date and they will half the time, then the, the state of Iowa, Massachusetts, whatever state they're in, has a formula for dividing up the family business. And guess what? Now you're an equal partner with all your brothers and sisters in your parents' business. It doesn't matter if you're the only one who's been working in the business. Your brothers and sisters have equal shares. What's that look like on Monday? Yeah. Guess what? Guess what the kids outside the business want really quick as soon as the last parent dies? I'll give you a hint. It rhymes with funny. <laughs> yep. <laughs> nope. you're, 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 you're right. Oh my gosh. And it ain't funny and they want it. And so where, where do the kids go for the cash to pay out their brothers and sisters? Um, no, you're right. They reach into the company for free cash flow. It's not there. The business fails. 
And then everyone reads the local newspaper and goes, oh, man, look at that. Another, you know, that next generation just didn't have the drive or the, oh, or, the, or the passion for their parents, the way their parents did. What a shame. All next gens are losers. They're lazy spendthrifts. I'll tell you, Ed, that narrative drives me crazy because I'll tell you where the blame for that little transition lies. Yep. I'm a dad. Yep. To be honest with you, every time I've seen you speak, you start the conversation with raise your hand if you have a will. <laughs> and, uh, you, I mean, you're exactly right that so many times that we get involved, I mean, that's exactly what, what has happened. And, and they just don't understand that just that little document, and it doesn't have to be complex, but it does have to be, to be a roadmap on what happens. And one of the more fascinating things that I've heard you talk about is your fair and equal conversation. So when you have multiple family members and you're constructing this roadmap to succession, how do you determine what's fair and equal? Yeah, no, it's a great, it's a great question. You're cutting right to the core of the issue. So uh, just to go back to your first question, which is how can children kind of start this conversation or get at this whole transition issue and, you know, kickstart the conversation. I'm a big fan, this is going to sound bizarre, but I'm a big fan of next gen getting their own wills completed and then giving their parents a copy of their will, which sounds bizarre because you're parenting your parent should be the other way around. I have a copy of my parents' will. I don't know what the big deal is, but, but I think when kids share their will and say, look, in the fullness of time, you know, nothing says we die in order. Here's my will just so that you know. Um, And so often parents will reciprocate and, and it will start the conversation around the transition, not just of the business, but of other family assets. It it will also lead to, and this is the major theme in my, my book, Willing Wisdom, is this real urgent need for families and business together to create family meetings, at least an annual family meeting where family gather and have these conversations and get at that central question of fair and equal. So in our family, and I'm, I'm seeing this a lot now, I'm seeing a lot of parents who are looking at their business and as they're moving into their 60s, 70s and 80s, they're actually taking money out of the business, which they ought to do. I mean, to have 80% of your wealth wrapped up in one illiquid stock with no transition plan is insane. So they're pulling some of the wealth out of the family business and in their family meeting, they're actually starting to trans. Are you ready for this? This is beautiful. They're starting to transition cash to the next generation. And at that same moment, they're asking all the children in the business, uh, in the family, do you want to return that cash that we just gave you in exchange for shares in the family business based on a proper third party valuation? Yes or no. Ed, follow the money. If the children want cash and they don't like the business, they will take the cash and they will deploy it somewhere else. Maybe start their own business, maybe invest it in a public stock market, whatever. But parents should pay attention to the answers. That's powerful information. It's powerful information. And it's the same, a dollar is a dollar. Whether it's a dollar sitting in the retained earnings that's pulled out as cash and then given to the kids as cash versus giving them a dollar worth of equity, it's the same dollar. But do you see how that conversation leads to more honest answers? about totally. people's ultimate commitment and passion to the business. But one of the things that crops up is the competency of that next generation that, you know, can you run the business the way I ran it? Can you do the things that I do? Do you have the same risk tolerances as, as I do? Even if you're going to reinvest, I guess, how does the assessment for both sides, how does mom and dad evaluate junior or the daughter? How does the kid evaluate whether or not they are, you know, a potential candidate to have the level of success that mom and dad did? Yeah. So uh, a great question. And that is another question. One of the 12 questions in the book uh, is while I was purchasing my father's business and I was not quite at 50% before I pivoted, he, just because I was buying the business, it never took the business off the market. In fact, I was always reminded that that company was still in play. While I was a minority shareholder, he was always entertaining and could uh, maintain uh, other offers, uh, entertain other offers. Absolutely. So that's a, that's a key point. 
because often when family members start to purchase their parents' business, one, five, three, eight percent at, at a time over over time, uh, often families stop thinking. They think, well, this is they're on a kind of a singular track for succession. And I'm like, not in our family. Remember, I told you my father high five me. Right. Well, yeah. well, I figured out pretty quickly that he never stopped trying to sell the business while I was buying it. Right. And, and right? Uh, yeah. not, yep. it, he wasn't crushed by the news. He was like, well, that's what people do. They change their mind with investments. Why wouldn't you change your mind? That I changed my mind was actually something that he kind of looked at and was kind of, kind of proud of. Like, well, let's listen, we, let's, let's get this business cleaned up and sell it to a third party. We ended up selling it to a strategic buyer who paid a much higher multiple. Yeah. And now in the fullness of time, guess who's going to be the beneficiary of that transaction? Grandkids. <laughs> Me. Yeah, you and the, I you have and a copy kids. of my parents' will. I can yeah. see how the money in the fullness of time will transition to my brother and myself. Now, have you ever met anyone who has inherited cash and been disappointed? <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> oh my God. I, I seriously, when you get the emotion out of this stuff and you look at what a business is, it's a, it's an instrument of wealth creation. It's not your pet. It's not your family. It's not your friend. It's not your community. It is an instrument of what it goes up in value and it goes down in value. I tell business owners all the time, it's time to wake up, wake up. Yeah. Well, how, it's, and and, it's, and how and do you get that? Well, I, I, well, when I'm doing my public speaking, I'm, I'm reminding business owners that their business is not their legacy. They may be very proud of what they've built and they should. I mean, they should yeah. rightfully so, but no one is going to remember them for their business. Let me ask you a question, Ed, yeah. and I already know the answer. Actually, I don't know the answer, but <laughs> let me ask you the question. Fire. Who is the founder of Coca-Cola? I have no idea. Well, don't feel bad. When I'm speaking in front of, a, you know, 300, 3,000 people, I can ask that question, and you know what I get? Crickets. Yeah. Nothing. Nada. Silent. No one knows. And no one even Googles it. No one gives a damn. Coca-Cola, the third most valuable consumer brand in the world, and no one gives a damn who the founder was. Yeah, but then the now business owner, but the business owner is saying, you know what? That's Coca Cola. This is uh, Joe's Auto Service that has five locations around. In this case, Central Indiana. I mean, they're saying, well, you know, it's not relatable. And I'm saying here, yeah, it really is. No one cares who Joe is. Um, no, you know, yeah, uh, no. So no one. So I wanted to ask you in dealing, with, like for example, millennials. Is there a different conversation between the different levels of? age brackets. Are you seeing any different dynamics there or no? I think actually what I'm seeing is real common themes. If you look back mm, 10 good. years, 30 years, 40 years, every generation wants something that is more intoxicating and valuable than money. Oh yeah. That's interesting. It's control. It's control. It's control of their own lives. And when we, when a business founder infantilizes their children by controlling their livelihood, not for 10 years, but for 50 years, it's, it's twisted and it's damaging and it's pulling apart families from the inside out. Wow. And it's been that way forever. Nine out of 10 firms in America are family owned and controlled. This is a massive problem. You know what? That, I never looked at it from a control standpoint. I, I mean, Intuitively, I understand that, but from a, a warped way, you know, that you are indirectly, whether it's intentional or unintentional, controlling your kids that way, that's a, yeah, I, I never looked at it that way. Thank you for that. Um, well, yeah, and, it, and it's always held up as the opposite. Look yeah. at the gift that I'm giving my children. Look at the shortcut. Look at the opportunity. Look at the, it's, it's like all the balance sheet, all the, all the debt is on the children to be, you know, so much gratitude towards their their parents for this wonderful opportunity. Hey, listen, if all we expect our children to be is some version of ourselves, we'd never have the Ford Motor Company. Guess what Henry Ford's father did? What? He was a farmer. Oh, yeah. We'd never have Microsoft. Guess what? Guess what Bill Gates' father did? No idea. He's a lawyer. And Steve Jobs? Steve Jobs' father ran a restaurant. We'd never have Apple. If, if that's what we think, that we're giving these gracious gifts to our children, we're often killing the next generation's authentic ambitions. It is not a gift. It's the opposite of a gift. We are robbing them of something truly more valuable, which is the opportunity to go off and struggle and be the people they're meant to be. 
if it's not going to the kids, let, let me look at from a, from a raising capital standpoint, a lot of business owners that, that we talk to say, you know, I want my kid to be in part of the business, but I'm going to convert it into an ESOP. Good idea, bad idea. Or not a big fan. I mean, it's, it's, it's a valid exit strategy. ESOPs yeah. are a valid exit strategy for, for the person trying to get out of their business. Right. If you think it's, it, but for the, for the folks that are now in business with a lot of their fellow employees, right. I mean, how do they get it? How do they get out? Well, right. I mean, I, there's one thing that we, there's one thing that we know for sure. And that is people like their business to live on, especially business owners who have taken wealth out of their business and they have more, more surplus capital than they can spend. You can see how in, in enticing the idea is that their business is their legacy, right? You can see that this is the thing that the greatest work of art and the ESOP represents that, like that really typifies that, that mindset that right. the people who helped me create the wealth will now be owners of this business. Newsflash owners risk capital. I'll tell you the number of debates I've had with people in my audience and business owners, especially who gift stock, and they say, I, I challenge them. I say, why are you doing that? And they go, well, if my employees have equity in the business, they'll think and act like owner. And I'm like, dude, it is not, that is not going to make, it's the, it's the debt. It's the risk that makes someone think and act yeah. like an owner. Nice. Totally. What's your opinion on family offices? I'm, I'm seeing more and more family office kind of uh, shepherding this whole idea. Is that helping That's or hurting? That. Absolutely helping. Yeah, Absolutely helping. So and I'll tell you why, because very few, very few American families make the leap from operating business to broadly held holding company. Uh, and, but that's what, that's what the really successful family businesses do. They get over the idea that they've been shoemakers for 50 years, but really what they are is in the business of making money. And so what do they do? They, they monetize a big chunk of that operating business or all of it. And then they move to really, really hold a lot of different investments in a lot of different currencies across a lot of different asset classes. And boy, now you're on a trajectory for creating and sustaining dynastic wealth. And they're teaching the next gens on how to be investors and how to take risks and how to mitigate risks. So, I mean, that's really the goal, yeah, right? It's, totally. it's, it's not the goal to perpetuate one, one business. Right. I, I don't believe. No, I agree with you. Well, if you had one piece of advice that you could give the listeners that would have the most impact on their business, what would it be? Get a will. That's get a will. And it. when you get your will uh, and have a family meeting, actually, before you ha write your will, it'd be great to have a family meeting and say, your mother and I need to update our wills or write a will. And before we do that, we'd like to have a really open, honest, respectful conversation about what you guys want and how you think the wealth should transition and how the business should transition and get into the issues that we've just talked about, Ed, and and, and bring some clarity to this stuff. I do not understand why there's so much secrecy around estate planning so that, you know, when people are grieving, they're going to find out what they get. Like, I just don't understand that. It's so, it's so counter to what I grew up with in a, in a family. I'm 58 years old. I've been to 53 consecutive family meetings. That's what we do. We meet, we talk, we share, and we build plans together. I mean, isn't that why we're in business Amen. to create yep. and sustain and transition, not just wealth, but family values and family relationships, build families that work well when we're gone. Isn't that the goal? Amen. Nope. hundred percent. So what's the best way we can connect with you? So I make it really easy. The title of my books are also my website. So every family's business.com is my first book, the book on transitioning a family business and willingwisdom.com is my sequel to that book, which is dealing with the transition of family meetings and the role of family, um, family meetings, family wealth. So yeah, it's, mm -hmm. um, super easy. Yep. Yeah. Um, well, I'll have, uh, I, I always like to make it, I always like to make it very clear Ed. I'm a, I'm a speaker. I, yep. I speak at a lot of industry conventions, yep. but I am not a consultant. This really frees me up to be, mildly opinionated <laughs> <laughs> well you see you see ed i'm not conflicted oh, i, I, I just love sharing a perspective and if people disagree with me i'm okay with that 
I'm not running for office. I'm a thought leader and uh, I love, I love speaking, but I, I really am not wired to, uh, to work with individual families. Well, you know what, the, like each time I've seen you, I mean, you, you take away a few things that you hadn't thought about that start some meaningful conversations. And like I said, I've seen you several times and certainly the, the folks that I've worked with have had a direct benefit as a result of the, some of the things that you've said. So, so thank you so much for that. All right. So, well, I appreciate the Congress. Thanks. Ed. Yeah. Well, appreciate. you know what? And, and again, for, as far as this podcast, you know, thanks so much for being so generous with your time and experiences to uh, help family business owners maximize value and more importantly, transfer the wealth. So again, thanks so much. And, uh, I look forward to, are you got, well, let me ask you, do you have a third book coming? I'm not really certain what else you can add, but do you have uh, what's next for you? You know, I am so busy. I've done over a thousand page speeches in 26 countries. I am so busy <laughs> with these, with these two books. Um, yeah, I I'm, I, if, if there's a third book in it, in me, it hasn't really revealed itself. I got yet. it. I got it. Well, you know what? Thanks so much for your time. And like I told you at the beginning, it, it was a highlight for, uh, for me on this podcast to have you on. So thanks so much. That was fun, Ed. Thank you. This was another episode of the Defenders of Business Value podcast. For more episodes packed with strategies to increase the value of your business, visit DefendersOfBusinessValue.com for show notes, transcripts, and free tools to start you on your journey. Subscribe now so you don't miss any future episodes.